Okay, uh, good morning. I think uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. So this is the session on digital forensics and cultural heritage. My name is Matt Kirschenbaum. I'm from the University of Maryland. I'm an associate professor of English there, and I'm also the associate director for the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities, or MYTH. And with me today is Rachel Donahue, who is an archives doctoral student at the iSchool at Maryland, and also a uh, research assistant at MYTH. Uh, can people hear me in the back okay? Is the sound good? Okay, good. Um, so the, the project uh, briefing for this morning is um, really in some sense about a report uh, that is due to be published today. How's that for timing? Um, this will be out sometime during the day from CLEAR, the Council on Library and Information Resources. Um, I'll say more about it in just a moment, but in addition to the report proper, um, I think in some sense the, um, the sort of more important context for the session is to open up a wider discussion more generally about the convergence of these two topics, digital forensics and cultural heritage, and I'm hoping uh, we, we should have ample time for that towards the end. Uh, so the, the report itself um, is um, co-authored, well, I'll, I'll get to the, my co-authors in a moment too. I should say we're funded by the, uh, the Mellon Foundation, um, and um, the report will be available both electronically online from the CLEAR website, and it will also, in another couple of weeks, just in time for the holidays maybe, um, be available in hard copy, so you can um, order it in the, the usual way from CLEAR if you would like a, a hard copy. Um, so the, um, the authors, in addition to myself and Rachel, um, we are joined by Richard Ovenden, who is the um, Associate Director of the Bodleian Libraries and the Keeper of uh, Special Collections there, and also Gabriella Redwine, who is an Electronic Archivist and Records Manager at the, the Ransom Center at, at UT Austin. Um, so we are your four co-conspirators. Um, in addition to the, the authoring group, there were six uh, consultants who advised us um, on the report, who read drafts, and who also um, authored a series of sidebars on more specialized topics that appear throughout. Um, you can see them there. Um, we've tried to be as interdisciplinary as possible in our representation, both in the authoring group and amongst the consultants. So we have uh, digital forensic specialists, we have information uh, specialists, we have um, archives people, uh, we have people from the, the scholarly world. Um, just, I'm, I'm going to move through these first few slides very quickly, um, but just to give you a little bit of the sort of backdrop behind the project. Um, this was initial, initially proposed to Mellon back in early 2009. Uh, they, they funded us for um, a year to conduct the actual research and writing. Um, in this past May, there was a two-day uh, symposium, um, also uh, sponsored by the Mellon Foundation at the University of Maryland. And so we convened this symposium um, as both a way of garnering feedback on an earlier draft of the report, but also as a way of um, sort of providing some, um, some focus uh, to the, the community. And I'll say more about the symposium in a moment too. Um, and here we move forward through the revision process. Here we are, December 2010. And at the end of this presentation, balloons will come down from the ceiling and the report should be live on the web. Um, the audience for this um, includes certainly um, specialists in cultural heritage, um, archivists in particular, uh, particularly those working within uh, manuscript collections, 
Um, we also hope to reach um, some people in the, the technical forensics world. Um, I think importantly, the audience also includes scholars, humanities scholars, textual scholars, really anyone with an interest in the, uh, the, the transmission of, of documents and textual artifacts. Um, the audience includes funders, and um, I should also add that it includes um, donors, um, originators of born digital materials um, who um, might find it to be a useful reference. Um, the purpose, again, is largely to introduce the field of computer forensics or digital forensics to cultural heritage community. Um, it's to identify um, some uh, points of convergence. And finally, it's to um, create a basis for further contact and collaboration between people in our world and uh, people in uh, legal settings, um, in computer security, uh, the commercial forensics industry. Um, I, I won't linger over the table of contents either because I think, again, later today I'll be able to uh, peruse it for yourselves. Um, I'll note that um, the, the sort of heart of the report is this long middle section which we've entitled Challenges. Um, we have a section on ethics. Um, we have conclusions and, re and recommendations, which I'll touch on in the presentation. And we also, I think, crucially, have a, we have two um, very data-rich appendices uh, compiled by Rachel, which survey um, the hardware and software that is currently available for various kinds of forensic analysis. So it's a sort of useful um, sort of holiday shopping guide for that. Um, that archivist in your, your life. Um, the Maryland meeting, um, these are some of the people who spoke. We had about 60 people um, this past May. Um, the, one of the key reasons for how holding the meeting at the University of Maryland, just up the road in College Park, is the concentration of um, government expertise, industry expertise um, in this area. Um, and so we had, um, in addition to um, people from cultural heritage, we had representation from, uh, from NIST. Um, we had the Department of Defense there. Um, we had the National Archives there. Um, we had several commercial vendors. So the, uh, the, the location um, proved to be enabling. Um, so I'm going to move from the uh, sort of the, the overview of the, the report proper into um, a discussion of uh, digital forensics itself. Um, I suspect there are probably varying levels of familiarity um, in the room, um, but um, to at least give everybody a kind of common basis for discussion, um, I'll start with this definition, which is a few years old by now, but it's, it's one I still keep coming back to. I, I like it. Uh, computer forensics involves the preservation, identification, extraction, documentation, and interpretation of computer data. I particularly like the inclusion of interpretation there. Um, this is CNI. It's not um, CSI. Um, there, this is a, um, a, something I found online on a blog by a professional forensics um, analyst. And it's a, you know, a, a fairly actually a sort of personal and moving account of what it means to be, to, to live one's life on a daily basis, peering into the, the murky depths of people's hard drives and the, the kinds of material that one finds there. Um, he has this um, very um, sort of bracing injunction for you to think about everything that you might have stored on your computer, um, everything that's there. Um, seriously, think about it. I'll, I'll give you a, a moment. Um, I think one thing that we tried to emphasize both in the report itself and in our thinking about uh, the digital forensic space is that it, it, it does not exist in a vacuum. And I think particularly a, a humanities um, perspective um, furnishes us with some important contexts. Um, there's the field of diplomatics, which originates in the uh, 17th century as a kind of science 
use of document authentication, um, much better known in Europe and Canada than it is here in the States. Um, there is questioned document examination, which is one of the um, forensic sciences and revolves around uh, paper analog materials, uh, authorship attribution, detection of forgeries, the sort of thing one might expect. And I think crucially there's analytic and uh, descriptive bibliography um, from the world of textual scholarship. Um, I think over and over again in our work on this, we were struck by the, uh, the, the, the parallels, the analogs that exist between um, thinking about books in particular as physical artifacts and thinking about born digital objects in the overtly material ways that um, forensics asks us to. Um, there is a domain, a branch of uh, forensic science known as um, trace evidence. Um, it's a field that was really pioneered by this gentleman, Edmund Lacard, back in the late 19th century. Um, this is the person who really pioneered techniques behind looking at things like um, you know, paint chips and you know, um, sort of the, the, the inevitable physical material remnants of actions in the, the physical world. And his core uh, dictum that every student of the forensic sciences knows is every contact leaves a trace. And we've certainly found that this holds true in the, the digital world as well as the analog world. Um, there's some interesting work um, around uh, treating the computer as a, a crime scene, um, not necessarily the sort of framework we might want um, in an archival setting, but I think what is useful here is the way in which the, um, the perception of a computer as a kind of complete environment is reinforced. Um, so potentially everything about the machine is of interest not only to a forensic investigator, but also to, to an archivist and to a, a future scholar, um, certainly features of the, the hardware itself. Um, simple sort of questions like, did the user work with two displays in tandem? Um, if you're interested in an author's composition and revision process, it actually might make a big difference to know that there were sort of two large screen displays that she was working with, as opposed to if you think back to the original Mac classics where you had that really tiny screen with only a small portion of text that would be visible at once. Um, certainly, um, the complete environment in the sense of the operating system, potentially everything that is on the, the hard drive. Um, there are several different um, sub-branches, sub-domains of computer forensics or digital forensics. Um, we focus in the report very heavily on file system forensics, uh, which is essentially the analysis of um, file systems on storage media, be it a hard drive or some other kind of media. Um, there are other areas of forensics, though. Um, a lot of them revolve around operating on live systems and sort of detecting and uh, fending off hostile intrusions. Um, not of, I think, such immediate relevance for us. Um, the last two, however, I think are going to become increasingly important. Um, there's the space of, of web forensics and um, mobile forensics. Um, both of these, I think, are of obvious significance um, for this community. Um, so a little bit of um, sort of technical theory, if you will, to um, just uh, present a few um, kind of baselines. Um, one of the, the, the key terms um, that a forensics specialist would be acquainted with is the, the idea of remnants, of data remnants. And uh, you can see a definition there, data remnants is the re residual physical representation of data that has been in some way erased. 
Um, what you're looking at on the screen, um, on, uh, at the top you have imagery from a technique known as magnetic force microscopy. Um, you're looking at bits on the surface of a hard drive or really more precisely you're looking at a series of magnetic flux reversals which collectively uh, constitute one or more bits. But the, the key thing to notice is the, um, there, there's that kind of blurry area along the top um, that's what's known in the trade as an erase band. And what you're seeing there is a result of the phenomenon that the read-write head of the hard drive um, never writes in exactly the same physical space on the drive twice. Um, we're talking about tolerances that are measured um, you know, at the, the nanoscale here, but nonetheless with sophisticated instrumentation you can detect those uh, discrepancies and theoretically, the, the key word here being theoretically, um, use imagery like this to reconstruct a, a file. Um, there are no known cases of that actually having been done in the literature, um, but it's a kind of um, you know, exotic and exciting claim that one often sees proffered. Um, and then on the bottom here, that's actually, um, I believe, um, a a, that's, that is um, shredded hard drive platters. Um, I like to include that image because the, the ultimate DOD standard for sanitizing magnetic media is to destroy, disintegrate, or smelt it. And so I think what's notable about that is um, really a, a, a worldview in which the only sort of true um, safeguard um, against the, the remnants um, phenomenon is to physically destroy the media. Um, so we have the sort of the, the, the physics of um, storage media on the one hand. Um, we also have file systems. Um, I'm not going to linger over explaining what a file system is for this audience. Um, suffice to say that it is that which translates between the experience of a document or some other um, electronic object that you sort of work with in the real world on your screen and the actual stored representation of that document or object on um, some piece of media um, where you know, what happens down at the level of storage is not nearly as sort of coherent and homogenous as you see presented to you as the end user on the, the screen. Um, I've listed some common file systems here and a skilled forensic analyst um, and increasingly uh, digital archivists will need um, you know, rich familiarity with um, many of these. Um, I have a, I, I've um, written about this at more length in a book called Mechanisms and there I introduce a distinction between forensic and formal materiality which essentially corresponds to these sort of um, twin areas of, of interest, both the, the physicality of the media itself on the one hand and the, the workings of the file system um, where um, what's happening at, again, at the level of the disk is ultimately very different from an, what an end user experiences. Um, I discuss these in terms of forensic and formal materiality um, as a one way of making that distinction. Um, you can, in the published literature on forensics, you can find um, you know, sort of scary um, cautions like this that it's essentially all but impossible to erase a file system in its entirety, um, and that's a function of the way in which data is propagated through the, um, the, the internal operating system. Um, another key concept from the forensics literature that I think is especially useful in an archives setting is the idea of an order of volatility. And this is something that you'll find presented in one form or another in most any forensics textbook. Um, essentially what we're doing here is we're looking at different states that data can be in, either on a network and or within a, a file system. And so the order of volatility is making distinctions between um, 
data that is stored, say, in RAM memory, um, data that is in swap space, um, data that is on some kind of external media, and I think that this is useful as a way of underscoring that when we're talking about digital data, um, it's, it's hard to generalize. The kinds of um, analysis that one might do with um, something that is on a, a floppy diskette um, is going to be different from um, trying to reconstruct traces of something that was happening in RAM, um, maybe by looking at uh, the machine's registry. Um, let's see. So this is one um, example of the kinds of um, findings that forensic analysis can um, reveal. Um, what we have here is a disk image um, of an old, um, an old Apple II game. It's called Mystery House, and it's being presented here in an Apple II emulator. Um, if we use a hex editor to examine that same uh, disk image, we find what appear to be instructions for some other game. Um, and from this, we can begin to make inferences about the history of this particular uh, individual piece of storage media, this individual floppy diskette. And we can, for example, um, go ahead and um, find out things about the residual traces of um, this other game and when it was published compared to when the um, Mystery House game was published, and again, in ways that I think are not ultimately unlike what an analytical bibliographer would do, um, we can begin to reconstruct um, histories of individual electronic artifacts. Um, another central technique um, in the forensics world is what is known as data carving. Um, this is an outgrowth of the way in which data is uh, stored on your, your drive. Um, data is stored in clusters that are of uh, fixed size. So if you've ever wondered why you have, for example, a very tiny text file that's still taking up you know, 4,096 kilobytes on your disk, it's because of the way in which the file system is allocating clusters. And as a result of that, what often happens is that you have unused space, what's called slack space, at the end of a cluster because the, um, the data that you're storing in that cluster is not exactly the same size as the cluster. Uh, data carving is a technique that a lot of the um, forensic software packages that are out there um, will offer as a way of leveraging that phenomenon. So it's essentially a way of discovering um, data that is at the, the end of a particular uh, cluster on the disk. Um, particularly useful for allowing us to reconstruct files. Often what we find is that a, um, a file um, may be may be deleted in part but not completely. So data carving allows us to reconstruct the file by finding a piece of its header here in the slack space of one cluster and that gives you the file type and once you have the file type, um, you can begin to take steps to again reconstruct it. Um, uh, we seem to have dropped an image, but this was a slide about the, the registry and um, particularly on, on Windows systems, these sorts of things one can learn from uh, looking at the, the registry. Um, checksums, um, I've, I've lingered over sort of um, data recovery, but one of the um, sort of, I think the most important way that forensics is currently being used in archival settings is not for sort of CSI style data recovery, but for mon more mundane practices around documentation and authentication. Um, checksums are a familiar concept that any of the standard forensics packages will uh, provide functionality for. Um, so this is essentially the, the algorithmic hashing um, for purposes of um, verifying that a file has not been altered or tampered with. Um, one of the fun things about um, working in this space is that there, there are great toys. 
Um, this is FRED, or the Forensic Recovery Evidence Device. Um, this comes in both desktop and mobile incarnations. Um, essentially, what you have here is a tower that is um, loaded up with lots of uh, different drive bays for um, either imaging multiple hard drives simultaneously or um, various other forms of storage media. Um, I think those are currently retailing for around um, 15K, which is you know, certainly expensive, but it's not, um, it's not necessarily out of um, scope for a, um, a, a larger um, institution. Uh, Stanford has a couple of these. Um, Emory, I believe, has just purchased one. Um, you also have portable drive capture devices, and these are designed for field investigation. Um, in the archives world, um, it would be useful um, for visiting um, a donor and being able to image um, a, a file system on site as opposed to taking possession of the computer itself. Um, moving into software, just again trying to give you a quick overview. Um, what you see here is a, a screenshot from NCASE uh, published by a product of guidance systems. This is currently the sort of um, Cadillac suite for um, uh, forensic software. Um, very high-end commercial. Um, and then we have, at the other end of the spectrum, we have SleuthKit, um, which is open source. Um, it's a set of um, Unix shell scripts um, for various kinds of uh, disk image analysis and uh, data extraction from the disk images. Um, it also has a sort of um, somewhat more user-friendly um, HTML layer that's called autopsy. So actually what we're looking at here is SleuthKit autopsy. Um, again, this is open source software and it comes with a much better price tag than NCASE does, uh, but you really need to be comfortable sort of messing around um, at the, the command line um, in order to install and use it. Um, so in, in the archives world, um, as I was saying a moment ago, um, I think the, the, the core uses for uh, forensics are really in the, um, the areas of authenticity and integrity, um, certainly um, discovery, um, a software package like InCase is very good at allowing you to, uh, to essentially bookmark um, individual data clusters, and so you can bookmark them, you can annotate them. Um, you can see why this would be useful for a forensics investigator trying to build a sort of um, case presentation, but it's also potentially, I think, a, a powerful um, scholarly environment for the analysis of born digital materials. Um, redaction, uh, commercial forensic software is very good at finding things like uh, pornography, credit card numbers, social security numbers, personal um, identifiable information. And um, it turns out that that's often the sort of thing that, that donors want archivists to redact uh, before their material um, goes public. And then finally there is the, um, the, the data recovery um, techniques. Um, some places um, in our world where um, this um, software and the hardware is currently being used, um, the, the British Library, uh, Jeremy John there has been a real pioneer here, and he has um, some discussion of forensics in the, uh, the, the Digital Lives report that they just uh, released um, about six months ago. Um, the Bodleian, um, Richard Ovenden, again, is one of the co-authors on our report. Um, Stanford and Emory, who I both mentioned, um, UT Austin, um, where Gabby Redwine is, and um, also Myth at, at Maryland. Um, no doubt there are other places as well that I've um, not included. And so I see boxes and arrows, so that must mean it's time for Rachel. Not sure what to think about being known as the one with the boxes and arrows, but 
at least it's easily identifiable. So this is kind of fun because usually when I go to conferences, I'm the one that gets up here and says, so everybody else up here has really practical things to say, but I live in research la-la land and I'm going to tell you about my dreams. Um, but this time I actually get to talk about things that are practical and uh, the way you would really use these in the archives world. Um, so I have up here what, if there is a typical archival workflow, could be considered the typical archival workflow, um, except that really I could have put appraisal down at the bottom pointing at everything, like I have preservation pointing at everything. Um, basically, um, you identify stuff that you might want, you get the stuff in, you look at the stuff and identify what's worth keeping again. Um, you process it, which is the uh, sort of getting intellectual and physical control and describing it and arranging it in such a way that doesn't disrupt the way that it might have been originally ordered. Um, and while you're doing that, you also determine what you want to keep and what you don't. Um, and then you do reference for it, and reference is basically search and access. You're finding things that people want um, and you're giving it to them. Um, so the question here is, where can forensic methodologies and tools come in handy? Um, everywhere. Um, everywhere. Um, but before I get into how specifically it can be useful, um, I should point out that it's not a panacea. Um, I might describe some things that sound like magic, and indeed they look like magic the first time that you do them. Um, but they only look like magic when they actually work, and they often don't. Um, so the uh, first thing usually where you will get, this will come in handy is when you are actually getting the collection. Um, in archives we call this accession. In uh, digital forensics um, you might find this referred to as acquisition um, uh, or evidence collection. Um, and you might also hear acquisition in the archives world, but the difference is that that's just like the stuff came in, whereas accession is we have legal and intellectual control over it. Um, and at Accession, you'll have both hardware and software tools that will come in handy. Um, up there, we have a, a couple of things that um, do two special things. One is they can take hard drives and attach them to your computer, whether or not you have a bay for them. Um, the other is that they do physical write blocking. Um, back in the days of floppy disks, we could, you know, flip a switch and make sure that no matter what we did to the disk on the computer, uh, it would not affect the original data. Um, but now, there's really no way to make sure that what we do um, to a hard drive that we have attached doesn't affect it except to use a physical write blocker, a hardware write blocker, which will prevent anything from going back at whatever you're uh, looking at um, while, you're, while you're gathering your data. Um, and then, of course, you, you know, you don't just push a button and have the data get acquired. There are ways that you have to do that. And the methods for imaging vary greatly. From down the bottom, we have the DD command in Unix, which um, might be a little scary. Um, this goes up to a sort of pseudo graphical interface. Um, this is an image of a live CD called Clonezilla, which is actually really, really useful. Um, and it walks you through how to use the commands, but doesn't actually give you anything to click on with your mouse. Um, and then you get into appraisal. And this was actually almost the hardest slide for me to put together, because it's like, well, how does forensics really help you with appraisal? Um, and in forensics, this would be sort of the examination and the analysis phase. And I got to thinking about looking at big collections. Um, if you're appraising them, you don't look at every item. There is no way you can do that. Um, you might do some sampling. You might look for specific kinds of records. Um, and Forensics packages give you um, a variety of ways to really automate that. Um, they can make it useful for finding the things that are really worth keeping um, or the things that are worth flagging for evidence in a trial. Um, and up here we have screenshots from um, the Autopsy Forensics Browser, uh, the, the Forensic Toolkit, um, and Encase. And uh, you can see that although they are really technical, they have pretty friendly interfaces. Um, processing, um, which in the forensics world might be called case management or reporting. Um, this actually is a place where, in, in addition to the imaging and the capture of the data, uh, forensics really shines um, because 
doing digital forensics as a criminal investigator is all about creating the dossier and, say, and, and figuring out what evidence you have um, and, and arranging it in a way that's useful to prosecute. Um, whereas processing uh, in archives is all about identifying what you have so that people can find it um, and putting it in your archives in such a way that also people can find it. Um, and um, so case management is, it, it gives you a variety of tools. Matt was talking about annotation and bookmarking. Um, you can uh, collect things by individual um, or, um, which is maintaining the provenance or the fonts like we would in archives. Um, and uh, it, it gives you a lot of opportunity to add metadata for description. It's not exactly EAD compliant, um, but it is all there put together for you and would do in a pinch. And they do some of them export in XML. So if you wanted to, you could do an XSLT conversion um, to EAD. Um, and then there is reference, um, which I think is sometimes in, in under-examined aspect of archives, but is really important, because kind of what's the point if nobody's going to use them? Um, and in forensics, this would sort of be the discovery aspect that um, would be used as much by the prosecuting lawyer as the uh, criminal investigator. Um, and I have here a screenshot from the Windows 7 search box, um, which I don't know if you've used Windows 7, but strangely, it seems to me that the Windows search box has gotten less complex as it goes on, which maybe is easier to use, but also means you have a lot fewer options for how you search, which means you get back a lot of irrelevant results. Um, and when you're dealing with big data sets or entire computers full of information and you're trying to find something for a researcher or for yourself or an exhibit, that can be really difficult. Um, but if you look at the screenshots that we have up here from um, P2P Marshall, Paribin P2 Commander, um, and I think another one from FTK, um, you'll see that they give you all, many, many more complex options that you can search by, um, which makes it much easier to find something specific that you're digging for. And these vary from um, your ordinary things like keywords in the file name and file type to keywords in the um, document itself too, because a lot of uh, digital forensics is about identifying pornography, um, searching by how much color of a specific sort is in um, an image. And then there is preservation. Um, and I have in the background there the MD5 hashtag uh, checksum from this presentation as, as of 10.25 AM, which can only be generated using a copy of this pres presentation as of 10.25 AM. So if we were to run it again, um, we would know that Matt tampered with this presentation right before everybody came in and he introduced us. Um, so, so that you know it goes to show. Uh, your authenticity, um, although in reality, if you were going to do this, you should really use like SHA-256 because people can backwards engineer MD5s. Um, and sort of the other aspect of this is packaging and storage, which there's a lot more to preservation than that, but Forensics is really good at packaging and storage. They, they have, if you look at the hardware, they have really nice setups where they keep their database on a separate hard drive from the, software, from the software, which is on a faster hard drive um, to maintain the integrity of the database and also just make things run much, much faster. Um, it's, it's, a nice, it's a nice setup, really. Um, and uh, makes it easier to access and find things. Um, and then they also do uh, packaging. Um, if you're familiar with the idea of metadata wrappers, um, they do that. Um, and they also do that other kind of archiving that I don't like to call archiving. We'll call it file serialization. Um, if you want to put all, all of your files in one sort of um, uncompressed zip or something like that, um, they automate that very easily. Um, and I think that's it. So these are the things you can do, but I guess the question is, do you want to? So this is something that um, Cliff was at our May meeting at Maryland, and um, in his way, he often um, gets to the, the, the heart of an issue. And uh, here's what he said at our closing discussion uh, back in May. Uh, how many of you would want to be the subject of a forensic investigation? And I think that speaks to not only a kind of um, 
you know, public relations problem for digital forensics in an archival setting. But I think also more, more, more importantly, um, it does really capture, um, I think, um, really what's at stake when a donor entrusts particularly a, a hard drive um, to a, a collecting institution. Um, hard drives really are sort of the, the reflecting pools of our digital lives and um, their ambient environments that capture all manner of information, both things that we overtly save to the drive, but also all manner of, um, again, sort of ambient events that um, we may not even be aware of are, are taking place within the, um, the operating system. Um, so there, there are some cautions, um, I think, that we should um, present with respect to um, using this technology in a cultural heritage setting, and including terminology, um, first of all. Um, there are issues around um, e expense um, and training, which is also um, in and of itself expensive. Um, not every institution that wants to begin uh, utilizing forensics in their workflows needs to go out and buy one of the, the FRED machines that I, I showed earlier, but there's still going to be some sort of investment, again, in both hardware, software, and uh, training. Um, the, I think the sort of, um, the, 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 the key um, sort of observation we might have is something Rachel touched on a few moments ago, what, what we think of as the smoking gun fallacy, which is, of course, what legal forensics is all about. It's about finding, you know, that, that one you know, really incriminating piece of data, that one file, whatever it might be. Um, and I think in the, in the scholarly world, um, we're, we're going to want something different. We're going to want more uh, flexible ways um, for discovering um, information that is potentially of interest to us. Uh, we're going to probably embrace ambiguity rather than seek to, to resolve it. So I think, um, you know, again, the sort of smoking gun um, modality from forensics is not necessarily one that will translate well to our world. And finally, um, there are all manner of ethical questions um, which we spend some time on in the report. Um, this is, I think, really the, the, the takeaway slide, and I'll, I'll leave this up as we open discussion. Um, but in terms of uh, next steps, um, to summarize what we present in the report, um, I think there, there, there was a lot of energy and momentum um, in the room at Maryland back in May, and I think people felt strongly that that momentum you know, should, should not be lost. And so we've tried in the report to very briefly um, outline some uh, tangible next steps forward. Um, these include um, policy frameworks at the administrative level amongst uh, different collecting institutions. So this is with regard to um, don't, things like donor agreements, uh, best practices, uh, the, the legal implications of forensics work. Um, if you were to, for example, discover child pornography on some piece of media that a donor had turned over to you, uh, you actually have a legal obligation to, to report that. And that's something that I think um, you know, repositories are going to, to have to contend with. Um, so um, our first recommendation then is for coordination at the administrative levels amongst different collecting institutions um, in terms of various sorts of policy frameworks. Um, coupled with that, um, we have a, we, we, we had a strong sense of the value of regional networks of um, collaboration, so more at the level of an individual archivist who is processing a collection. Um, it's not the case that every individual institution needs to have a high-end forensic setup. Uh, there are possibilities for sharing resources, for sharing of expertise, and so these kinds of regional um, collaborative networks um, we think are also going to be very important to sort of 
complement what's happening um, at administrative levels. Um, requirements for tools, um, something I touched on a moment ago. Um, I think as our usage um, of some of the available forensics packages uh, become sort of deeper and more widespread, uh, we'll begin to see points of friction, uh, things that we want to do that those um, packages do not support, and um, things that they do support that seem sort of um, out of kilter with, with our world. Um, I think the way forward here is going to be an open source and uh, sponsored research as opposed to the commercial vendors providing what archivists need to do their jobs. Um, but we will need to scope out requirements, I think, for additional tools in this space. Um, I think, crucially, um, there's a need to both articulate a research agenda. I think we have some fuzzy ideas of what scholars may want to do with born digital material, particularly when coupled with um, forensic analysis. Um, I think we can predict that, that data mining, social network visualization, these sorts of activities will become much more important. Um, if you're a historian or a literary scholar looking at gigabytes of data on somebody's hard drive, it's not going to be possible for you to manually examine all of that material, so you'll need to rely on automated tools. But I think we, we still only have very sort of sketchy ideas about what scholars might really want to do with this material. And that's, I think, um, itself related to the next bullet point, which is a real need, I think, to collect, um, as, as Seamus Ross was fond of putting it, better stories. Uh, where are the really compelling case studies? Where are these stories about things that researchers are actually doing uh, with born digital material and the kind of um, tools that are available to them? Um, training, um, I think, is, is self-evident. Um, a lot of the corporate training programs are going to be beyond the financial reach of people in our world. Um, so I think we'll need to provide alternative venues for uh, training in forensics methodologies. Um, Cross-publication of research, uh, there's a real gap, a real divide um, in the sort of uh, professional literature in legal forensics, which tends to be, um, I think, sort of under-theorized, um, and then um, sort of what's happening in, in the archives world. And so um, I think, you know, th even things at the level of you know, special journal issues and so forth um, could help with the sort of cross-fertilization of the research space. And then finally, uh, terminology mapping. It was um, observed numerous times that um, both the legal world and our world share concepts like chain of custody. And so pro providing a kind of common mapping for people to talk back and forth to one another um, was seen as essential. Um, that's what we have for you today. I think we're, we're happy to take questions, and as I was Looking at my email on my iPad while Rachel was speaking, I did get a message from Clear that the, the report is now is now up. So how's that for, for timing? Thank you. <laughs> and so I think we're both happy to take some questions, comments. So I'm, uh, I'm not an archivist, uh, but uh, it seems that when you're accessing paper, you know, once you've created the box and put it on the shelf, the archivist's role is mostly done. I mean, at that point, the researcher is going to examine the documents and do what they want. Uh, it seems clear that perhaps making the disc, full disk image available for researchers is, uh, is more questionable. Is it going to require sort of much more continuous intervention by the archivist uh, between the researcher, essentially facilitating access going forward? Clearly, I'm technologically challenged and can't turn on a microphone. There you go. Is it, oh, is it on? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, exciting. <laughs> um, so will there be more intervention required than with paper? The answer is yes, but maybe not for the reasons that you think. Um, 
sure, giving somebody a full disk image might be a bad idea. I think it's pretty rare that they're going to ask for a full disk image, at least at this point. Um, but the real issues of resources and, and personal intervention that you get is just because of the fact that they're digital materials and you can put paper in a closet and it'll kind of do its thing if you keep it in, you know, good temperatures, low humidity, no bugs. Um, whereas with digital files, you know, Matt showed um, Mystery House in an emulator because you can't take an Apple IIe to, to disk today and uh, put it into your PC or your MacBook Air and have a play. Um, and the same is true with most digital files in that you need to do something active in order to keep them accessible. Um, and, that, and that is where your biggest intervention comes in. Um, I do think that there, there will be more redaction necessary than there has been with, with physical work. Um, but I also think that that redaction will be a lot easier because unlike with paper where I would have to sit there and like scan through looking for social security numbers if I were trying to clear things of personally identifiable information, um, I could write a script in Perl and have that automated and be pretty confident that it would get most of them. In fact, it would be more likely to get things that are not social security numbers than to not get all the social security numbers um, and, and feel and feel confident that that was safe to give to a researcher. The, um, a lot of what you talked about was dealing with locally stored content, content stored on, on local hard drives or local media. It seems to me that there's, I wonder if there is work being done on the kind of the forensics of content coming from or evidence coming from the cloud. Uh, this is really important because a lot of human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and some of the citizen human rights organizations like um, Witness are capturing uh, evidence from the web and from, and from various social media. Um, and that, that will come into their archives eventually. And I'm just wondering if there is some, if there's application of this to, uh, to that kind of material. Yeah. Um. So um, again, we, we, had a, we made a very deliberate decision to, to focus on file system forensics, partly because of, or really largely because of the sheer volume of, of legacy material that's currently uh, coming into archives. But you're, you're absolutely right that obviously uh, the cloud, Web 2.0, um, this is where a lot of current and future activity will be concentrated. Um, I think the, 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 the key thing to say there is that the barriers there are as much um, legal and societal, if you will, as they, they are technological. Um, anytime, you know, as soon as you start talking about Facebook or Twitter or any of the big online services, um, you're also talking about EULAs and terms of service, and these things are often not constructed in such a way that say next of kin have easy access to personal data, um, let alone an archivist. Um, the, the best paper that I know that's a kind of um, overview of the, the issues here um, is by Simpson Garfinkel. Um, it's called, um, oh, some, the, the Internet Footprint is in the title, something the Internet Footprint. And that would be the place to start. Um, he makes the, one of the points he makes is that data on a local file system, such as a stored password, is often what um, somebody will need to unlock um, somebody's you know, online life. And so there is, I think, a kind of permeability between the, the local file system and what's happening in the cloud that's important to acknowledge. I think the only thing I would add is that the Another good resource, which isn't even remotely official, but is one of the best that I've seen, actually comes from the blog Lifehacker. Um, they have a really good guide to sort of archiving your social media self um, and also um, making a sort of a cloud-based will in terms of what you want to be done with your data um, should you pass away and ways to um, securely ensure that if you have an untimely death, um, whatever you want to happen with your data will happen to it and somebody will be able to access it. Um, kind of a follow-up to, uh, to Dean's question about the researcher. Um, it, it, it seems to me that one, one of the things that we are losing today, uh, uh, say for example in one branch of literary 
uh, uh, research is the ability to see the different drafts and the editing of the different drafts because people tend to write on top of that file. So it would seem to me that um, um, uh, giving the tools uh, of the, the disk itself to a researcher uh, would be one way that they could try to mine that for the changes that went into uh, various iterations of a draft of something, right? Yeah. Howard, did we did we plant that question with you? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the um, there, there was an, the the New York Times book review published a piece a few years ago that included this this heartbreaking comment from Sadie Smith, the novelist, that she doesn't have any of her digital drafts because she just control s's and saves over. And you know, I think the solution there is actually very straightforward. It's not to use magnetic force microscopy to recover the erase bands of her manuscript drafts. It's to, it's to educate. And I think um, providing people with sort of, um, I don't know, archivally responsible computing practices, um, you know, that's, that, that's simply an essential thing that, uh, that needs to happen. Um, I do know that archivists who I speak with, um, there are sort of legitimate concerns and debates about where is it appropriate to intervene in somebody's creative process and at what point are you sort of crossing uh, that line? Um, yes. But the, you do have things like once a year the Library of Congress throws a personal digital archiving workshop which is sort of to educate people about how to do just that. You have uh, software vendors becoming more aware of that issue. Um, Office 2010 has built-in version control should you choose to use it. Um, but you do also have to think about really the ethical implications. If somebody hasn't said in their donor agreement that you can go through and, and use, you know, stake analysis and, and other things to find all of the hidden data on their hard drive, is it, is it okay to do that? Um, and then no one's waiting, so uh, a separate uh, uh, question. Um, uh, this, this gets to the smoking gun kind of, kind of issue. Um, uh, there, it seems to me there's another reason for us to stay away from the smoking gun in that there are anomalies that happen that are not, not necessarily due to the, what looks like the most obvious reason. So, for example, uh, uh, your, uh, 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 you, uh, the, the example you gave that Matt didn't change his talk or did change his talk because of the date stamp, well, maybe Matt can't control the uh, uh, PowerPoint and every time PowerPoint uh, opens, uh, this happens to me at least, uh, it rewrites over the file and, and, and there's a different date stamp on that. I mean, there, there, there are all kinds of anomalies that, that, that happen and I would caution us from thinking that something has been messed with necessarily. Uh, uh, it, 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 things happen in the digital world that are a little bit different than backdating of documents that happens in the analog world, so. That, that's true, although um, it, was, it wasn't just a date stamp, it was something generated from the actual bits of the document. Um, and we kind of like to say in the archives world that um, when we're talking about authenticity, we're saying that the document or the record is what it claimed to be when we got it, and it hasn't changed since we got it. And there are ways to make, sure, to make things stable, to make files write proof so that when you open it and whatever you open it with, um, it's not going to get rewritten to by the autosave. So the, the, um, the algorithms and things like that to, to ensure that the integrity of the file is maintained is that it's been maintain, maintained since its arrival at the repository. So you are absolutely correct um, that that you know, happens day to day. Um, and, and uh, but ultimately also, I mean, obviously once it's in your chain of custody, uh, there, there, there are other things that come up, but you know, in the same way that there have been historical uh, uh, attempts to doctor uh, uh, um, uh, paper documents when they're already in the custody of an archive. Um, 
someone who's uh, very savvy about computer forensic techniques probably could doctor those as well, could simulate some kind of key uh, to, to be the right key to, to, to put there. You know, as it, it's, it's, the, it's the chicken and egg thing that you always have as you develop new security methods, you develop people who know how to defeat those security methods, and then you, so you do still new ones. So. Which is why I suggest using SHA instead of the MD5 that I actually yeah. use, because people have, you know, hacked that. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, you know, and also the larger context for your remarks, there is a kind of aura around digital forensics with all of its sort of CSI connotations. And I think researchers will ultimately need to be educated and encouraged to sort of retain their critical skepticism. And you know, at, at the end of the day, in our world, you're still going, you're going to have a human being looking at a set of documents or artifacts and drawing conclusions. And yeah, forensics is a very important tool, but I don't think it will ever subsume individual yeah. critical judgment. Good. If you want some really fascinating reading um, with math that I don't understand, there are some really great articles on there on um, detecting images that have been altered since they were taken. Um, it's really, really quite amazing what they can do. Hi, Jonathan LeBreton from Temple University. Um, can you talk a little bit about the uh, uh, the prospects for training uh, in terms of developing a community of practitioners. What, where is that going to be happening in your view and what, if anything, gives you optimism that we'll have a cadre of, of uh, practitioners in this pretty cool area? Um, so two specific things I could mention. I know that um, UNC Chapel Hill is the, the recent recipient of um, some funding from Mellon to um, begin a, um, a forensics uh, sort of training module in, in their archives program. Um, and I think this is a kind of pilot study, so I think the, the results from that should be, should be watched. And um, I'll also say that um, a little bit of a personal plug, but the, the Rare Book School at the University of Virginia uh, now offers a course in Born Digital Materials that I co-teach with Naomi Nelson at Duke. Um, and we do include forensics in the curriculum there. Um, I've also seen it pop up in you know, pre-conference workshops and tutorials and sort of in a more ad hoc way. All right, well, um, I think it's break time, so thank you very much. <laughs>